Advisory Board for Container alongside some other brilliant people. And I've had the pleasure of curating and inviting tonight's panel of four change makers, each of whom are bringing their own um, distinct perspectives and experiences on what it means to take up space online. So tonight we'll be unpacking the questions and tensions that we've been thinking about and living through to do with digital activism and we'll explore some of the potentials, pitfalls, complexities and contradictions inherent in using digital means and spaces to create radical change. And before I introduce and hand over to our four speakers tonight, I wanted to give just a very brief bit of context for tonight's discussion, which really feels very timely, relevant and necessary. And um, really we're trying to do this work um, because we're living in a world where global and multinational companies have the monopoly on how we experience digital, digital innovation. And often, um, they perpetuate the very injustices that we're trying to fight against as people working towards a more just future. Um, through my work in the creative sector and um, a lot of the work I do is with Rising Arts Agency in Bristol, where I'm an, um, oh, hello, where I'm an exec uh, producer there. Um, and I'm really interested in how uh, these notions about how we actually take up space on our terms and shift paradigms of power. Um, how do we actually genuinely create change, radical change that goes to the root of the issues caused by capitalism, uh, imperialism, racism, patriarchy, ableism, and their intersecting oppressions? Um, particularly, you know, there's a lot of critiques around Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, how it's using our data, how it's asking us to convert our cultural capital into capital for the attention economy. Um, and, you know, whilst digital activism is not a new thing, it's maybe happening now on a scale um, that we haven't necessarily seen before. And following the murder of George Floyd um, and the subsequent BLM uprisings, we've seen a real upsurge in online content to do with racial justice and other calls to action as well. And in particular, this has been happening in... Uh, in terms of um, the Black Lives Matter protests um, with huge, uh, like hugely impactful uh, posts like Morel Harper's 10 Steps to Non-Optical Allyship going viral in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, and also in the midst of calls from Black Lives Matter's organizers against the kind of cult of activist stars. So it's within, within this kind of context that we're bringing this conversation and particularly thinking about the impact of this kind of work on individuals, um, the overwhelm, the exhaustion, the commodification, and also the performance of allyship that are happening within norms of productivity that can lead to some really unhealthy um, ways of existing in the world. But of course, it's not all doom and gloom. There are lots of positives and potentials with this kind of work and the digital revolution that we have seen um, as a result of COVID has, as Grace Quantock speaks to in another article on Container, um, she says, at the beginning of the pandemic, I watched everything go online very, very quickly. And this was infuriating because, of course, we'd asked for things to be made accessible online for years and we were told it was impossible or impractical and wasn't going to happen. And this is from the perspective of someone who um, is a wheelchair user and has wanted to see this kind of change um, for a long time. And I know that there are a lot of people who are seeing the access that we're, we're that the digital kind of revolution in the last year has been a really positive thing, although bittersweet. Um, and really what I'm trying to ask today with our beautiful speakers is um, what do we as change makers and allies need to operate as safely as possible in digital space and how can we create real change? So really tonight is about embracing the complexity and the emergent nature of this conversation and recognizing that really this is not the start of the conversation, but a point on a continuum of trying to figure this stuff out. Um, we are really trying to expand and open up this conversation and are really excited that our speakers will be kind of delving into their perspectives on this. So to introduce our panelists, we have, um, we have the fantastic Josephine, 
Jesse, a creative producer and director who speaks very honestly about challenging subjects and promotes social change and raises the voice of underrepresented people. Um, we have Tori Tu, an intersectional climate activist and mental health advocate. Daniel Brathwaite Shirley, an artist working in animation, sound, performance, video games, communicating and archiving the experiences of being a black trans person. We have Grace Cress, the founder of Shelby X Studios, which merges art and activism to build community, create educational resources and share accessible information that counters harmful mainstream narratives. I'm so excited. Um, we are going to hand over to the speakers who are each going to speak for about five minutes, introduce themselves, their work, their thoughts on this subject. And um, we've left this really open. So we're kind of really excited to see what they're gonna speak about tonight. And then after that, we'll have an open round table discussion about some of the key themes that we've picked out about digital activism and what we might want to explore further. At any point during the event, you can ask a question and throughout the conversation, we'll try to weave these in. So over to you, Josephine. see me? I can't see myself, so I'm just wondering if you can see me. Yeah? Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, um, Rosanna and Katana, for having us. It's lovely to be here. Second of all, there is so much I could talk about on this topic, so this is simply just a smidgen or a start, but I'm so excited to get into it. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd set some context for those of you who don't know. Um, maybe I could call myself a digital activist. I haven't considered any of the work previous to this piece um, to be digital activism. Um, but I created a piece in response to the killing of George Floyd back in May. And it was quite an amazing experience um, and good context for me because it was something that was physical in the context of Bristol um, for the billboards, the rising arts campaign to becoming digital and publishing it online. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to talk about because it, for me, it felt really real and it almost has a double impact. And I think it's really empowering to be able to kind of speak on these issues that are even really far away. Um, some of the questions that I've kind of been exploring, because um, this has been a really good time for me to reflect on all of the work that I've been doing is how my work and just digital activism work in general is being digested online and how are we able to see that? Where is the time and space for real reflection online in comparison to the real life context? Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to show you the short film for those of you who haven't seen it. Hopefully it's clear and um, you know, able to see it. And if you have, if you could wear headphones, that would be great. So please play the film. I'm sick of death. I'm sick to death. I'm sick of death. From all the way over there, how could you understand that to walk outside your door might mean fate has other plans? You may never return. Instead, you'll be dead, murdered on the streets like a rodent with disease. white man stops you on your way, thinks you've got too much to say, so he tears away your life, makes you beg and plead and pray. We ask ourselves why, but the question is, why not? Why would the white man change with no orders from the top? No justice, no peace, no racist police. 
the blood is on your hands, the blood is on your hands, the blood is on your hands. So, Mr. White Man, what are your plans? Um, yeah, so I'm really interested in, as I was saying before, the consumption of online um, activism and looking at what the difference is in consuming something that is pleasant and aesthetic and pleasing versus something that is explicit or violent. And again, through the reflections that I've been doing since um, knowing that I was going to do this talk and, and the project, etc., I've noticed that I personally am more triggered and more drawn to action by watching things that are more explicitly violent because that's actually what I've grown up watching online and that's what's learnt, that's what I've learned from and that's what's taught me. So really interested in how this new wave kind of more easily digestible things are perceived and what actually people are doing after that. Next slide please. So thinking about that as well, um, kind of goes into this idea of high productivity online um, and kind of not, not forgetting that what social media is for or what it has been for before, that you kind of go online to judge people and to show what you're doing. So when you bring activism into play, how does that manifest and how and where do you like take time to care and how resilient that you have to be to be doing this work a, just because for, for me personally, it's traumatic. All of this stuff, stuff comes from a personal, deep and dark place. Um, so yeah, just really recognizing the importance of being aware of that energy and effort as yourself, but also as people that are digesting that information. Um, so this, these are two quotes of things that people have said to me since the release of this film. Um, the first one I think is hilarious because it kind of baffles me that someone would ask what my next move is in relation to this work because for me this is a timeless piece and it wasn't a move to like you know create content and you know do stuff it was a move to actually create change and share a message and ask for questions so obviously my response was I'm going for a bath and I'm going to chill out because it's been a lot um, and the other one you're smashing it I think that said a lot I even say it to people where they're doing this kind of work online but it's just really trying to recognize it that we're not trying to smash it. We're actually just trying to do the work. And because the work is being brought online, it's almost like the sense of performatism. And so it's that thing about setting your own pace versus creating content. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so yeah, this all feeding into, you know, people's personas online as well. And like how this can play with your authenticity and what you're doing. Um, I had a really good discussion with my friend the other day and we came up with this thing, you know, fame. What's the difference between, or where's the line between creating change and creating fame? Um, because people are believing and listen to you as a person so then you're then expected of. But then what pressure, what is that pressure doing to you and what's that doing to your authenticity? And this is an amazing quote from one of my really amazing artist friends, Beth Kirby, check her out. Um, she does loads of amazing artwork and she's in these beautiful women's bodies that, as you can read, she said, so regarding people wanting answers from you, I had someone out and out tell me that my Instagram account is all about positivity because that is how she reads my work. But my Instagram is about my artwork and it's my space. So just making sure that you hold on to that and allow people to understand that it's a passion, not a hustle. This is obviously personal. And just thinking about are people listening for the right reasons in the right way. And last slide, please. So back to my first point. Um, I, in reality, I would ask you to watch that and then wait some time, play it again, give you a minute to breathe, you know, talk, think, reflect. But now we're going to go into the next person. Uh, on to Tori. Thank you very much. Mm. 
Hi everyone, my name is Tori Choi and I am an intersectional climate activist and I'm going to talk a little bit about my activism over the past year. I mainly operate online as most of us do during the pandemic but I think there's a lot that I've learned from the past year that I kind of want to reflect on and share and talk about how we can kind of use online spaces for activism such as those in the climate movement. And I thought I'd start off by kind of showing you side by side my Instagram profiles from two years apart and how different they are, which, you know, for me, when I first started using online spaces, I was kind of working as a photographer and a wildlife filmmaker and I used my content to be my portfolio. And I think a lot of us kind of used our yeah our Instagrams as professional sort of platforms um, and then there wasn't that much that alluded to my personal beliefs or necessarily what I had been doing outside of my work and flash forward two years my personal life has become my work my you know every day I breathe live eat sleep climate activism and you know in part because of my desire to kind of embody my beliefs but also because I think that this is a cause which has such urgency and it's something that I try to carry through with me so yeah now I'm doing that full time and I kind of want to explore what I've been doing over the past year next slide please so <laughs> last year I will kind of preface this with um something that was quite a wild opportunity. I ended up sailing across the Atlantic Ocean to go to the UN Climate Conference in Chile. However, halfway across the Atlantic Ocean, I realized and many of our team realized that the conference had been relocated to Madrid, which was quite hilarious, but also very tragic. So upon realizing this, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, I, as somebody who was originally from Hong Kong, but living in the UK, I'm going to be in Colombia for three months now, because that's where the ship would end up. What are the optics of that? What are the optics of what I want to do there? How is it that actually it's less about me and more about the communities there? What can I do as an activist to kind of make sure that this project wasn't just all about us? And I ended up facilitating with two other friends, a project called Sail for Climate Action, which aimed to charter the sailboat back to Europe to amplify the voices of Latin American and Caribbean activists in global spaces, um, such as the UN conferences. And this was an amazing effort. I worked on some incredible projects and initiatives with Latin American and Caribbean activists in order to make this a reality. And we hand selected 30 um, people who were going to be part of this journey. And it was, yeah, an incredible achievement. And, you know, COVID happened and we got so far as Bermuda before we had to call the trip off because no one was going to welcome us with open arms to Europe in the middle of a pandemic. And it was one of the most heartbreaking things we had to do. There were so many tears. All of the participants were, you know, just absolutely distraught they'd made a new family they'd made friends we were all uniting behind a common cause which is to include you know most marginalized people and areas in the climate conversation and that left us with very little choice but to go online and I think I've learned a lot from this process and I kind of want to delve into some of these insights next slide please so the trip was cancelled in its physicality, but we ploughed on and we existed in online spaces. And I really just want to challenge this narrative that online activism is something which is, you know, supposedly not as effective as in real life activism. And in many ways, there is a lot of power in showing up to spaces in real life, campaigning and having a, a physical presence but at the same time, being online allowed us to connect with so many different people, allowed us to speak to one another at the convenience of being in our own homes with our friends and our families. 
It allowed us to plan ahead for what we wanted this movement to look like. And it allowed us to reimagine what we thought the climate activism realm could look like. And so, you know, I think that so much about online activism is highly criticized because they say it doesn't make a difference. But actually what we ended up doing through this is we ended up getting a lot of um, support and sponsorship from the German government to put on a program all about, you know, climate justice, more specifically with regards to perspectives from Latin America and the Caribbean. Next slide, please. So all of these events that we have put together are free and they are being pioneered by young people from indigenous communities, from climate movements in South America, from, you know, the Caribbean islands, from conservationists, from people whose stories and whose messages are so rarely heard. And this was all achieved through online means in the middle of a pandemic. And I really just want to emphasize that while, yes, there is so much to be said about protesting in real life, this is a movement that needs to become more accessible. And when you can't have you know, your physical presence speak waves about what you want to achieve. This is where an online community or an online platform is actually incredibly invaluable and also a lot more inclusive because everyone can share the spotlight in this regard. Next slide, please. I kind of wanted to finish this quick introduction up by talking about the concept of the echo chamber because much like online activism, so many of us are criticized for our emphasis on staying within our echo chambers and not expanding outwards and not inclu including people in conversations that are, you know, supposedly not really within their reach. And I definitely see the importance of including this message of, of saying, you know, we need to reach more people. I would say inclusion for me is important reaching audiences who may not necessarily have a say in this is important but there's also an element of the echo chamber that I really want to emphasize and that's safety and survival and for so many of our young activists and so many people that I work with including myself existing within an echo chamber is a safety net in many ways our ideas are sometimes seen as too radical too extreme they may offend people who aren't particularly, you know, engaged with the causes that we believe in. And I've seen it firsthand. My following on Instagram has grown by about 20,000 in the past um, few months. So I'm kind of used to now having lots of people coming into my space, demanding things of me or disagreeing with me when I talk about racial justice in the climate movement, when I talk about inclusion, when I talk about advocating for marginalized people. And part of my existence requires me to preserve my energy and to expend energy on people and, and spaces that will allow it. And so I kind of want to reframe this idea of the echo chamber to include perspectives of where this might actually be beneficial for people's health and their safety, as the online realm can sometimes be incredibly taxing and tolling and traumatic. Um, and that's something which is very, very personal to me. And yeah, that's all I kind of wanted to share for this five minutes, but I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity to speak about kind of what I've been working on. And our next speaker is gonna be Danielle. Hi, um, I'm an artist slash archivist that makes work that centers black trans people. And so that, what that means is that usually I work with a group of maybe 20 black trans people to create an archive that exists online and both physically um, centered around the things that we would like to archive. Um, the current issues with archiving now is that black and black and trans people um, aren't really asked what we want to archive. We don't often get the chance or the opportunity to archive ourselves. And the particular things that are archived about us are often maybe our trauma, are often maybe an event that happened to do with us, um, but it's never really about telling our stories in the way that we want and need to tell them. So when you go and access these archives, you see a massive gap in your representation of yourself. And you're wondering where, where am I? Where am I in this archive? And 
you're not you're not in the archive you're in the archive secondhand from someone else's experience rather than your own so uh, because of that um uh, when i when we make the work we really focus on like what we would like to archive and it's really hard asking the question to a bunch of people who have never been given the opportunity to archive themselves how can you archive yourself what do you what's important for you what do you think is important to archive um, and often we have a conversation around like this happened to me this happened to me this happened to me um, but it's about trying to focus on like what we need to center rather than what the world wants us to really center um, and for me i'm a big advocate for um, kind of creating spaces away from platforms such as instagram facebook um, and all these other ones um, because when you enter those spaces you're agreeing to a particular set of terms and conditions you're agreeing to abide by a particular set of rules that you cannot see um, and there's a particular ban procedure and censorship in place which you may or may not be aware of um, and getting away from that really makes you uh, create a space that can actually center those that you want to talk about for example, we made this project called Black Trans Archive, and the project was about centering black trans voices and however they wanted to portray and say these things, that the project was to make sure that happened. And what it meant is that we could have and create a framework that worked for us and for no one else. And so everyone that entered the archive had to tell us their identity. And depending on what the identity was would depend on what was accessible and what message was said. Um, and it was important for us to do that because one, on the internet, you know everyone has access to it. Anyone can access it at any time. And that's great. That's a really important thing. But it's important to know that different people um, are accessing it from a different place. And to know that um, you don't have to tailor to them in particular, but you can ask them in particular uh, questions and make them think about what actually they're doing. Um, and the thing I love about making your own domains is that often the interaction, I'm sorry if I'm speaking too fast, I will slow down. Often the interaction is um, not, pa not passive, it is active because it requires people to actively think about their own identity, what they have done and how they have uh, perpetrated uh, particular views. Sorry, my notes are here. Um, and so, when I, when I think about our current kind of maybe state of digital activism, I think act, digital activism has been happening for such a long time on separate disparate platforms and has never come together in the shape that it does on Instagram. And what Instagram promotes is a, a selling of the everyday, a selling of trauma, and this idea that, um, this kind of idea of activism tourism, in which means that you can kind of like, uh, kind of like get cookies and credits for looking and sounding like an activist but not actually doing anything and so um there's this like i think there's a huge kind of conversation it's like digital activism but actually you're not talking about what people have have been doing and are doing and the examples that they're doing you're actually talking about how people present activism and how that's this activism is presented online as content and what does that mean when someone's life someone's pain is one, the center of the conversation, and then two, presented, presented as content. That's something that I'm finding much more problematic now than ever before, because usually there was context, there was discussion, and there was um, a, a centering on what to do and how to do it, and the steps that would stay there forever, um, rather than a picture of pain. Um, and sorry, one last thing. Um, yeah, and so, um, yeah, I think I'm much more interested in this uh, idea of the aesthetic of activism, the kind of idea of selling this aesthetic, the idea you must advertise your own particular form of activism, whoa, um, <laughs> rather than um, actually knowing that these things that you're seeing and that you say you agree with require your action in order for you to back any of them up. I think that's my five minutes. Thank you. And on next, we have Grace. 
Thank you. Uh, so many um, good points made in all of the talk so far. So, um, yeah, hi, I'm Grace. I'm the founder of Shelby X Studios, which is um, an online platform that merges art and activism. Um, so I'm planning to talk really briefly, because five minutes isn't too long, about how digital activism features in my work, um, some of the tensions that I found, and then maybe some of the things that are often left out of this conversation too. Um, so Shall We Act Studios recognizes artists as cultural workers and creativity as a driving force for social change. Um, we're launching a new e-zine in 2021, uh, which will provide uplifting artwork and educational um, content to motivate communities to kind of take action. And we'll be bringing artists that are using their skills uh, for social justice together with grassroots campaigns. Um, so next slide. Um, it was born out of personal situations, but as well as issues I was recognizing within the activist community. Um, so given that we're online so much these days, I wanted to start by recognizing that there are real strengths to digital activism. Um, I experienced chronic pain, which limits the way I'm able to participate in street work in the way that I used to. Um, so for me, digital activism has removed certain barriers to participation um, and also, I guess, in some ways hasn't necessarily been uh, a conscious choice that I've made. Um, and I think COVID has highlighted access barriers that some people face every day. Um, maybe disability prevents you from being able to go to protests, actions, meetings. Um, a lot of people have small children or work unsociable hours. Um, and, and I think also we're recognizing that a lot of people are um, gaining consciousness around what's happening in the world and they're new to activism and just aren't really sure where to start. And so I think digital spaces can help to address some of those issues. Um, next slide, please. So, um, yeah, one of the biggest things I think has been around community and that finding other people you can work with and feel the same way that you do can be really energizing. Um, digital spaces have made it easier to campaign with groups in different areas. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in Bristol and now back in London. Um, so it's been good for that. Um, and even different countries, which has been, um, yeah, a, an interesting aspect of it. Um, next slide, please. So recently, a campaign for political prisoner Mumia Abu Jamal that I've been involved in for quite a long time in the US um, held an online conference bringing together activists from all over the world. Um, in response, I created some information graphics that I've then been able to offer as a resource for the campaign. Um, and it's made it possible to connect with more people through that. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so burnout in social justice work is really common and like I guess it's called the struggle for a reason. Um, and Shell React Studios creates resources and uplifting artwork that helps to keep us motivated and also I think a key part is envisaging the world that we want to create. Um, in some ways, I think digital space can afford us more capacity to think about rest because we don't have to physically travel to meetings and protests and things. Um, and I'm working hard to, to embed a culture of rest as resistance in the work that I do, um, recognising the healing nature of communities of care. Um, and I really think that's a route to our liberation. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so obviously there are also some challenges in the digital space, some of which I think really mirror challenges in physical spaces and some which differ. Um, so some of the questions I've been asking myself while setting up this platform have been around access, um, around who has control of the medium and the relationship between the digital and the physical. Uh, next slide. So um, on access, I've been thinking about who has access, uh, what is the impact of digital poverty? What boundaries can we set online to protect ourselves? Um, in terms of control, how do we keep one step ahead of state surveillance? Uh, can we beat the algorithm um, or is censorship just inevitable? Who holds the space and directs the narrative? 
uh, around digital and physical and those relations. Um, I'm exploring how do we create genuine communities of care in remote spaces? How do we connect online activism with activism on the ground? What are the crossovers and how can this actually build a stronger revolutionary movement? Uh, next slide, please. So Ashata Shakur said, theory without practice is just as incomplete as practice without theory. The two have to go together. And I think the same goes for digital and physical activism. We've seen like the impact of um, sharing information and what that can do, um, you know, the impact that that can have, especially in the past year. Um, and we know that the impact that direct action can have, and I really think we need both and that use can Together we can bolster the movement. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of a graphic I created with Green and Black Cross in Nepal, um, which is a guide for protesters. And it was really widely shared online, but then used in the streets. Um, and last slide, thanks. Um, so I believe that in order to dismantle the systems of oppression that we experience, we need to be able to imagine a world without them. Um, and also physically put those principles into practice. Um, being able to draw together different ways of resisting the capitalist system is a really important part of this. Um, I've, it's been amazing connecting with all the other speakers tonight and talking more about digital activism as a topic. And I guess it's only gonna become more, more and more relevant. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, so, so much. Um, loads of food for thought, and I definitely feel like we're just scratching the surface. Um, the BSL interpreters have uh, told me that I was speaking a little bit fast at the start, so I genuinely apologize for that. Um, and I'm just going to reintroduce our speakers. Um, so that's Josephine Giassi, a creative producer and director. Tori Chu, an intersectional climate activist and mental health advocate, give us a wave, Tori. Daniel Brathwaite Shirley, an artist working in animation, sound, performance, video games, and Grace Cress, the founder of Shelby X Studios. Thank you so much to all of you and also for the really interesting provocations that I think you've brought um, into the conversation. And yeah, as I said, it definitely feels like really fertile ground. Um, we've got about 20 minutes and um, I will be taking questions from the audience. Um, so please do uh, pop those into the chat if you've got suggestions for things you want us to dig into or specific questions for our speakers or someone in particular. Um, to start us off, I thought it'd be great if each of you could offer us one thing um, that kind of really stood out for you listening to the other speakers. And um, if we can go in the order of who has spoken, that would be great. Um, so over to you, Josephine, and then if you can hand over to Tori and so on. Thank you. Oh, Josie. Yeah. Thanks. Lovely. <laughs> um, is my audio okay? Can you hear me a good bit clear now? Cool. Um, I think one of the key reflections that I've taken is from Danielle's presentation. Um, when she mentioned about, you know, the censorship and the T's and C's online, as soon as you're, you're putting your stuff online, that's what you're kind of, your, your, you know. Um, yeah, it's just got me thinking. And I think it's just a really amazing approach that she's taken. Um, and it, again, it's that, it's making people act more because you can just passively scroll through your timeline on social media, like a few things and think that you're doing the work. Whereas she's actually created a space where you can physically, you have to go and engage on another platform. So that, yeah, I think that was a really um, key, big key reflection from Danielle's side. So thank you, Danielle. Um, and I'll pass on to Tori. I think there are so many points from all of those talks that I could spend all my time talking about. Um, but one of the things that I think really related to me and also intrigued me was something that Grace was saying about that graphic that she created for, you know, online spaces and then 
were used in real life by protesters. And I think this is exactly the kind of stuff that we're seeing in the climate movement as well, where we're having people who create resources, people who use their digital spaces and their skill sets to create conversations online that then become transferable into real life. And I just think that that's so important and we should really like never discount the power of how these spaces can really like transcend boundaries. Mm. So yeah, that was something that I really enjoyed listening to. Now, Danielle. Yeah, um, I think it was uh, Tori who's, I think you talked about hyper productivity. Was it you or was it Josephine? It was Josephine. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, when Josephine talked about hyper productivity, um, it really, really made me think about like that uh, desire to like post that um, these platforms make you have. Like you really want to, you know. Mm. I, uh, during the week, often I'm thinking like, what am I going to post on Instagram? What am I going to post? Um, and it's I don't know if it's like an addiction. I don't know. It's it's very it's strange. It's like yeah. a new feeling that like I feel like I'm failing something by not posting. Uh, like a picture of my cat like I'm not sure why we have that but it's it's um, an interesting kind of like pull because it feels like it's a necessity to feel like you exist in order to like make sure that your platform is fresh and up to date um, so I think that was just a really interesting point that got me thinking okay. over to you Grace go Grace um, yeah, wow, like so many points, to be honest. I feel like we need a lot more time. Um, <laughs> maybe even something that kind of ran through all of the talks, actually, around, yeah, that hyper-productivity, but also, um, you know, echo chambers of safe spaces. And then, like, what Danielle was saying about who has control of the narrative, too, and, like, um, yeah there's something about that for me that it's a bit of a balancing act isn't it trying to draw people in but also um, that we don't really have um, always have control over the narrative and that maybe being online affords us that um, yeah yeah thanks everybody really great reflections and yeah I think we can start to see this there's a lot of connection and alignment around this stuff which in and of itself is really exciting um yeah and a lot more we could explore we've got some questions coming through from our audience and um I particularly like this one from Martha King um she says thank you so much all so many inspiring points could uh, could you please say more on the ways we might practically resist the capitalist structure that pushes us to be productive and doesn't seem to value rest. So if you'd like to speak, just pop your hand up and we'll kind of, I'll, I'll come to you. Tori. I think so much about this quote by Audre Lorde, which talks about how you know, rest is an act of political warfare. And I think that so much of the time we feel like as activists or anyone occupying a digital space that you have to literally show that you are working to the bone and exhausting yourself. And for me, I now make a point to be very vocal when I'm resting uh, because I feel like it is an act of resistance and it's a way of demonstrating mm -hmm. to other people that we can still create change by showing that we don't want to contribute to the societies that don't value us. And so for me, practicing joy visibly, doing the things that I love and almost sort of like branding that as a form of my activism is something that I really wholeheartedly believe in. And I've noticed in my online spheres, it's creating a sort of ripple effect of change. You know, when I talk about my joy being resistance um, and as someone who lives with chronic conditions as well, it's something that other people learn to value and, and you slowly see that, you know, there's this sort of, yeah, this knock on effect of how you impact your communities as well. Thank you, Tori. Um, I also think it's about like, um, how like you can enable others to rest and like how maybe setting up events and a time for those people to rest, um, something like that's good that um, I think people should do more often is like having people being paid to maybe meditate or just sit down and do nothing um, or just like speak. Um, and because like usually rest is seen as a time when 
um, it's not worth anything apart from to yourself, you know? But actually it's worth a lot. It's worth so much more. Um, and if if people saw like the, the value in resting in terms of like uh, me resting actually doesn't cause me to stress about paying rent. Um, or doesn't cause me these uh, stresses in terms of like, I'm not able to like, I'm not making money right now. I'm not posting, I'm not doing this. In fact that like, no, your rest is just as valuable as when you're active. Um, seeing you rest is just as important as seeing you at work. I think if we try and like build that into our kind of like structures of working, for example, I don't know, for example, like on the first day, everyone works in the workshop and on the second day is two hours of the workshop, everyone's paid and no one does anything. Um, so yeah. Yes, Danielle, this is perfect. And exactly, exactly some of the things that we are trialing at Rising Arts Agency and in other, other spaces that I'm, I'm working with. I mean, if rest is an act of resistance and rest is therefore part of this kind of political movement, then actually we also need to resource it. And that is, yeah, finding ways to do that is really, really important. Money and, and otherwise. And speaking about that collective sense of care is really, yeah, like if you're uh, doing the work to rest yourself, then actually you're able to better support others as well um, in their rest and in their activism. Yeah, love it. Um, there's lots of questions here as well um, around um, kind of, I, this is really interesting one from Kaya. Um, what's your advice for an activist just starting out using digital platforms? And um, I guess in particular, I think that's quite interesting if we think about what we've spoken about already, what would be your advice to someone who's just starting out with this? What might you kind of advise them on building in from the start? We've talked about rest, but is there anything else that you feel? would be worthwhile than thinking about? Jace, JC. Oh, we can't hear you, I'm afraid. Hmm. No? Okay. Yeah. yeah? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Yeah, talk to us. Netta? Yeah, beautiful. Oh, hello, can everyone hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the biggest things that's um, helped me um, is using my support group and my support network, similar to what Danielle was just saying. Um, and this is obviously not technical, talking about reaching and engaging, but it's um, just about kind of when you're putting stuff out, making sure that you're letting people know, like your close friends, that they're aware so they can support you, but also like support you offline, but also support you online. Um, and I think it's really nice to see a, a massive impact when your work goes really far and, you know, it gets loads of engagement and it reaches places that you never think it would. But I think it's maybe even more impactful when it, it becomes um, apparent in smaller spaces or people that are close to you or um, just not always thinking about the likes and where it's going is what I'm saying. It's more about the value and the depth of it. So just trying to like not set too bigger expectations because sometimes that's not actually what's given the most value. Um, oh, there's so much else, but maybe someone who's been doing it more could jump in. <laughs> yeah, I would echo the same thing. Like, do it for the for the what you're driven by is like um, a good way to start. I think there can be so much online that feels like a lot of pressures coming from different angles. So I think it's really important to get rooted in like what are the things that are really important to you. Why are you doing this in the first place? Um, and also like that authenticity will translate into relatability with other people um, so yeah I think that's probably the, the most advice I can give on starting out is just to be authentic um, do what works for you and other people will relate to that lovely thank you thank you Grace and Josie and thank you for that question um I'm going to come in with one of my questions because I can do that. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've spoken quite at length as a group about this stuff and um, and your presentations have just given me like even more food for thought, to be honest. Um, but I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit about, um, well, really, how might we measure or understand the impact of this kind of work? Um, 
when we speak about digital activism or activism in digital spaces and really we keep using the word activism but what I mean is radical change so how do we know we're changing things um, through digital means and in particular you know what new ways of measuring might we want to introduce that actually go against um, yeah what a lot of platforms and spaces that are created for us and not by us what they perpetuate Okay, Jake. Jake. Oh, that, a, Danielle. Oh, sorry, no, you go for no, that's, that's okay, Danielle, and then we'll come to Jake's soon. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, in terms of measuring and statistics and all of that, that's like a really interesting thing. I don't know if you can measure it or should. Something about that, or something for me feels like that data should not be measured. Um, I think there's so much data that's already measured, so I'm a bit... I don't, I don't know, but I, uh, what I know is that um, things being online can make them more accessible. Um, things being able to be printed out can make them be able to be used, just like Grace had a great example. That's a really like amazing example. So I think that like, in terms of um, like success, I like things that are online and can be transferred off. I think that's really nice because they can invade in any space they need to um and like i i don't know if we if we need to measure it um because yeah i don't know like i think we'll feel if it's working and like usually when there's not enough activism happening people do more and they push more and they try more and they be way more experimental and they use every platform available that wasn't made for them to do this activism but in terms of like measuring i just don't know how we would do that <laughs> and and if I if we need to be like okay like your activism only brought in five hundred thousand people this month that's terrible how dare you do that we expect three million by next week like I don't think it's like <laughs> that kind of like um, com uh, consumption of numbers we I don't think we need that if it, if it positively affects one person in your community doing a good job yeah I fully agree and I think it's about that internal is that internal. Uh, change actually that's uh really interesting josephine did you want to come in no we only have five four minutes now so echo 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 what uh, danielle was saying but okay. also kind of not even old school because we've only been like online forced online like this year but just not forgetting that change happens with communities and organizing and coming together um, people learning in real life situations. So again, it's about the space, spaces for reflection and growth. Can you create those spaces for reflection and growth and trying to maintain or keep networking and observing. It's almost like research. Um, Cause yeah, and I'm not gonna talk anymore because we haven't got much time, but yeah. Thanks, Josephine, that's great. Um, I just wanted to ask a final question really to all of you, which is around, and maybe you can um, keep your answers quite short, um, but really what, what are your dreams? Like, what would it, what could it look like? Some of you have kind of started to paint this picture, some of you are doing this, but what would it, what would it look like if change making could happen in digital spaces or in ways in the future? In the future? What would that blue sky thinking look like? Can you paint us a, a picture of that before we wrap up? I'll be really short and just say it would it would be something like um, what was mentioned earlier, where there is half doing the work and half resting and playing. However, that's formed. That's that would be dreamy. Um, I can go. <laughs> I guess like that's sort of what I've been doing with Shelby X Studios is trying to imagine what that space might look like and and what those communities could look like and for me like community is such a huge part of that like accessible information that is free for us all to share and like interconnect with each other um, and to like bolster each other's activism um, I think is really important and I guess also that um, I just feel like they're so you can't have one without the other like we need to have uh, on the ground work and connections and that um, digital, you know, means have, have made things a lot more accessible and that's an amazing thing. So I think it, the vision 
vision would be drawing on all the positives from the different aspects and um, putting them together. Yeah. Thank you, Grace. I think for me, so much of it is is kind of just kind of piggybacking off what Grace said. How do we move these conversations to in real life? And so much activism online imagines futures that are, you know, potential for so much change. And I want to see how we can make our activism translate into real action in the real world. Um, so that for me is what what I think would be yeah, kind of like a utopia. Thank you, Tori. Um, I think for me, it's like some sort of like translation of like skills in terms of like, this person can build a website, these people need to be heard. Um, somehow, there needs to be a swap there um, for, for those uh, people to be able to speak themselves and actually not need any of us to be a conduit for them and like have that. Um, avail availability to actually make their own platforms to say what they need to say mm -hmm. as soon as they need to say it instead of like mm -hmm. waiting for us like I, that's the kind of like I think that's the thing in the way is like we have people that just like us we're all on this platform talking but I feel like that's what we're missing we're missing this kind of translation of like when we have these skills and ways of communicating how do we then say right here they are you use them, I'll help you set that website up. That's done, the next thing, the next thing. And then we just need that kind of, um, I don't know even know what to call it, but like, I just keep thinking it's like a translation. Yeah, like I, I wish there was like code basically written for every person that needed to speak so that they could understand how to write code and formulate these spaces for themselves. Beautiful, thank you so much, Danielle. And to the rest of you guys, it was really, Brilliant. Um, and we've really just scratched the surface. I think the fact that we are at seven o'clock already feels like it's gone really quickly. And I know that we'll be continuing these conversations in other ways, which is very exciting. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Um, I think you've been absolutely fantastic and brought a real richness to the conversation tonight. Um, and if you, if our audiences are interested in hearing about future events and articles, then you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter, but maybe do some resting as well. Find us at container underscore mag and sign up to the newsletter via the website containermagazine.co.uk. Um, we're really interested in how we can make Contain an online space for cre the creative tech community. Um, so do get in touch if you have ideas or suggestions for what we should be covering, what we should be doing. Um, we're also opening up for pitches in the new year for issue two. Um, so if you're a writer or content creator, keep an eye out for that. Quite a lot of the themes that we've spoken about tonight in terms of authorship, agency, privacy, data, community, and collective code is actually in some of the content that is on is in issue one online. So I'd really um, advise you to go and have a little, yeah, have a look. And um, just to say thank you so much to our BSL interpreters, to Alice, who's been doing all the slides, to Martin, who's been on the tech. Um, and finally, thank you so much to our speakers, Josephine, Tori, Danielle, and Grace. Um, and from all of us tonight, like, goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>